Hi there, welcome to this masterclass on frozen shoulder. My name is Philip Streff. I'm a professor at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, and I will go through some of the key aspects of a frozen shoulder with you. So let us first start with the use of the labeled frozen shoulder. So over the last century, more than one author tried to define frozen shoulder and various terms were used to describe this, uh, this clinical entity. All authors have tried to deal with a naming that should be more adherent and more appropriate to the etiology uh, and clinical presentation, but a complete agreement is uh, not yet been found. So as you can see, adhesive capsulitis, fibrotic capsulitis, primary idiopathic stiff shoulder, uh, periatritis of the sh uh, shoulder, stiff and painful shoulder, arthrofibrosis, tendinitis of the short rotator, uh, subacromial adhesive uh, bursitis, Duplass disease, uh, capsulite retractile, 50-year-old shoulder and, and contracted shoulder are just some of the examples of namings that were proposed. And uh, there is just one common feature, and that is it, it's an enigmatic, progressively painful and deliberating condition of the shoulder. And although there were different names, um, the, the painful and, and stiff shoulder still remains a, a largely cryptic uh, term, it seems essential to gain consensus on this terminology and definition, mainly for treatment guidelines, so that they, they can all be targeted towards the right uh, diagnostic uh, label. So frozen shoulder, well, it could well represent what the patient feels, uh, the, the, the shoulder that slowly freezes, that is locked as frozen, and that is eventually thawing with partially uh, recovery of motion. Uh, and also the international societies, scientific societies, as uh, the International Society of Arthroscopy, Knee Surgery, and Orthopedic Sports Medicine, uh, the American uh, Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Society, they all have published their preference for this term, uh, frozen shoulder. And not so long, you can see it on the slide, not so long, I co-authored an, an overview of um, uh, the frozen shoulders pathology, its assessment and treatment published in uh, Nature Reviews Disease Primers. And it will be this paper that will guide us through this uh, master class. Okay, um, let's look at some of frozen shoulders mysterious uh, characteristics. So first, about two to 5% of the world's population will have a frozen shoulder in their life, which is, which is massive. And 70% of them are women around their 50s. That's why we assume that there is also a hormonal factor uh, that might play a role in the development of, uh, of a frozen shoulder. And if you have a frozen shoulder, uh, the chance of developing a frozen shoulder on the other side within five years rises up to 17%. And mysteriously, if you, have, if you had a frozen shoulder, the chances of developing a frozen shoulder again on the same side are actually close to zero. So if you have one time frozen shoulder, you will never have a frozen shoulder again on that side. A frozen shoulder has an average disease duration of about one to three years. Uh, um, but in patients with comorbidities, and you think of uh, diabetes patients in the first place, they will be closer to the three years or even longer. Um, and it has been postulated that the frozen shoulder is self-limiting, uh, so resolving to normal, even if you do nothing at all. But this statement is a bit under pressure um, and probably not the case for many patients. And finally, the non-dominant side, well, is at least as often affected as the dominant side, which is bizarre because if you look at tendinopathies, for instance, in tendinopathy, it's clearly more often the dominant uh, side. So several risk factors are associated with the development of frozen shoulders, such as, and you can see it on the slide, uh, systemic risk factors, diabetes, hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, uh, uh, hyperlipidemy, extrinsic, intrinsic factors. Um, and you can all read them. I'm not going to read them out loud. But um, it is important to know that about 80% of all frozen shoulder patients have one or two of these comorbidities. And there are even more than three comorbidities in about 35% of all frozen shoulder patients, which is very, very interesting uh, for us as a researcher on frozen shoulder. So in theory, if you can avoid developing these conditions, these risk factors, you can reduce the likelihood of getting a frozen shoulder, which is interesting, of course. 
if you can avoid them some can some maybe are difficult more difficult to avoid but some of them you can't like type 2 diabetes it's possible to uh, to maybe to avoid or do something not uh, to get type 2 diabetes well your likelihood of getting a frozen shoulder will also decrease